Good morning and welcome. Uh, first of all, before we start, you know that every day we say the same thing. Uh, please look at the icon that has uh, that looks like a glove. That's for interpretation. So if you want to have the translation in different languages, French and Spanish or English, you can click there and, and pick and select the language of your preference. As I was saying earlier, welcome to everyone to the third day of the Women Impact Summit. We are extremely happy to have you here today. And um, I just want to share with you a couple of things. For those that don't know me yet, uh, I'm Maika Hill, and I'm the co-founder of the um, of Heroica, and I'm also uh, organizer of the Women Impact Summit. Um, as you can imagine, this fourth summit has been extremely special for all of us because it has been quite challenging in the current times uh, to be able to, to put this summit together. But I must confess that we are extremely thankful to our sponsors, our community partners, our speakers, and of course, to all of you, because um, our community uh, has given us the, the, the strength to continue searching for an amazing agenda and trends that interest to all of you. So thank you so much for being here every year. Um, the other thing that I want to share with all of you is that uh, this conference has become the fastest growing global conference uh, focused on women entrepreneurs from underrepresented communities. And Sometimes we wonder what it means to be underrepresented. You know, if you're a woman, we are already underrepresented. And I'm sure that our next speaker will confirm that with us as well. So I just want to say thank you so much for making all of this possible. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is a transition year. Um, last year during uh, the summit, we had in our platform, Heroica, more than 1 million unique visitors. And um, we are so happy that you are validating that we have created a safe space for all of you to share your projects, your ideas, your challenges, and the impact that you are creating in your communities. For all of that, thank you. Of course, we're going to need your help to build the new platform. So stay tuned because I have plans for all of you. That's for sure. And um, one of the things I want to share with you is that we are extremely proud of all the women that have been pitching in the past days and they're going to be pitching today. As you can see, our pitch session is the most diverse uh, and inter, you know, the most diverse uh, from all the different conferences that you can find around the world right now. So thank you so much for all the work that you're doing and for trusting us as well. Um, of course, I have to thank um, our sponsors, the U.S. Embassy in Spain and Andorra, Cheryl Porro Coaching, Casa Africa, Asociación Heroica, and of course, the Heroica team. And from our team, of course, I have to say thank you so much to Silvia, Irene, Irina, and of course, to our lovely interpreters that are here every day, Carla, Anouk, Pearl, and Andrea. Thank you so much. Um, I also need to thank our community partners, of course. Uh, the California Spain Chamber of Commerce, Glow Up, Emigrar y Emprender, WISE, Singular, Empovia, the Africa Diaspora Network, Start Out, Open Value Foundation, IAE, and the Inter American American, the Inter American Development Bank as well. So thank you to all of you for being our community partners. And uh, it is a pleasure uh, today. Uh, to have the opportunity to to have this amazing chat, fireside chat with uh, someone that I not only consider um, someone that is a, a prominent figure in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, but also I like to call her my friend, Almas Negash. So Almas, how are you? Good morning. Unmute. Hi, Micah, good morning. We're friends. We've been friends for so many years. So this is in the family, but I wanted to let the world know, I know how you started it. I know your passion. I remember from the inception what you were trying to do. And can I just say to everyone who is joining from everywhere, and I'm just happy to see a lot of Africans joining, Nigeria, 
uh, Zambia. It's really amazing. But I do want to say that I used to get very, very frustrated with Micah because she does everything by telephone and text and I like email. And so, and I've seen her do miracles with phone, which I could never imagine doing that. She'll just call me at the last minute, can you speak? I'm like, no, can you come with me to Spain? Yes, I did that. <laughs> so I just want to say um, your passion for women is uh, unmatched. And so just congratulations to you for keeping up with this. And it's not easy. And so I'm just proud for what you've done and what you'll be able to do. And your passion for global connectedness is something that you and I have in common. And I just want to applaud you. Uh, you're making me blush and actually tear up. So I'm going to, um, you know, I'm getting more sensitive since I became a mother, you know? So <laughs> this to me now. That's what motherhood does. Yes, yes, yes. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. The admiration is mu mutual. You know that. I mean, I'm a big fan of yours. And uh, what can I say? Uh, since we had our first coffee in downtown together. So. Oh, my goodness. Long time ago. <laughs> I yeah. know. So I, I'm just going to um, share with everyone in the audience a little bit about you, but because I we, I know that we don't have too much time and I would prefer them to hear from you, obviously. So Alma, as I said earlier, she's a prominent figure here in Silicon Valley. She has been recognized as a, one of the 12 inaugural members of President Biden's Advisory Council on Africa, Diaspora Engagement in the United States. She also has been named as a one of the 101 and soon heroes of Silicon Valley and one of the 100 outstanding women of influence for her significant contributions to social innovation. She's also the founder and executive director of the Africa Diaspora Network. Almas, what happened? How did you get here? I mean, oh, what no. can I say? <laughs> <laughs> What's gonna be next, really? <laughs> uh... So, Micah, first of all, thank you. You didn't have to read that. I mean, it's just so, some of these things that we, I think we earn. I think this time I earned it, you can say that, because nobody was talking about the diaspora. Really, we didn't get an attention uh, that we deserve. And, and I'm just going to say that, that 13 years ago, the only reason I, I think I had the privilege to start it, you know, starting something is in a way a privilege to serve it. To me, for me, it's a privilege. And I just felt like I'm in Silicon Valley. People are talking about um, social entrepreneurship, wanting to do great things on the continent, really make an impact. But the people that were trying to do that were wonderful friends of mine. They happen to be white Americans. And I'm saying, hey, wait a second, but where are the Africans? If you're trying to make a difference in Africa, we need to have Africans at the table. And when I realized that I actually was not productive, I became very negative energy into the group. So I said, okay, what would it look like if I just stopped bickering and start <clears throat> to imagine uh, the possibility of us, people to come and join us? Uh, so that means inviting other people to come to our platform rather than always waiting for other people to invite you. Really, that's the genesis of ADN. I had no idea we would become. Uh, who we are today, but I think in a way that's good because I didn't do it as um, as a one-off. I think it was, as you remember, it was very organic. We started very, very small with my own family funding. Today, we are going to be eight employees, but until 2020, I was the only full-time and a lot of contractors working at ADN. Um, and why is this important? I think it's an important thing at time for Africa as a whole, uh, uh, the attention that Africa is getting is well-deserved because it is one of the youngest and the most vibrant continent in the world today. It's not me saying it's been reaffirmed over and over, uh, a, a continent that is going to be 2 billion people soon with the youngest generation uh, at hand. And so that means talent is going to be immense opportunities will be immense. And of course, there is a lot of challenge as well that goes with it. I am happy to be at a space where um, the, the voices of Africans from the diaspora is also included in not only as a, as a means to an end, but as a, as a means in itself, simply because 
we, the diaspora, African diaspora, remits the largest amount of money to the continent than any other entity, any other entity. And the reason I say that is very important is we have a say uh, on the continent. We have a vested interest to make sure that our people are um, uh, not just surviving, but uh, thriving. That latter will happen, will take a lot of effort, but I'm very, very grateful for the opportunity to do what I do. Uh, I hope that answers some of the question, but I just wanted to start with that context and uh, how much I feel privileged to do this work. No, uh, same here. You know, I, I totally agree. I mean, uh, we go through many challenges, but uh, when you see what you're bringing to the community and how thankful they are, you, I mean, I don't know you, but for me, we are serving the community, as you said, you know, and I learned so much from you. Actually, Almas is the one that told me and opened my eyes, having a conversation with her, that uh, women uh, do not need to be empowered. We were born power and since that day i i started looking about the word empowerment and empower in a completely different way um one of the things that uh, you had uh, this year and i'm super happy is that uh, you had the eighth um investment summit uh, of the africa diaspora uh, network your symposium and um uh, the theme was a, a future ready africa uh, how does a future ready africa look like Oh, no, it's it's wonderful. I, I love that question. A future ready Africa is really an inclusive Africa, Africa that looks at all our capacity, uh, not only African capacity, but friends of Africa, a, a continent that brings everyone together. And in a way, Africa is that, you know, you can imagine we have when you go to any place on the continent, any country, you will actually be coming back and saying, am I in Africa or other place? Because the diversity is incredible. We have Southeast Asians, uh, uh, Europeans, uh, uh, um, Indians, every imaginable community in that continent. And then you you can see the diversity that we have. And so Africa, uh, the, 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 the future ready Africa will be the continent that will invest in its youth. It will invest in the woman that you're talking about. We know that women in Africa and other countries give put more than 70% of the activity and yet still get less than 5% of the uh, outcome. That has to change. If you wanna make a change in any place, first invest in women, why? Because a mother or a woman would first feed her children, support the family before she can even save a penny for her own clothes. And I know this, I'm from Eritrea. I grew up with a mother who was just like a, a tigress making sure that all her children, and we were eight, I was number seven. So you can imagine how hard uh, mothers work to make sure that their family are safe. So I think the future Africa will have all of that, but it will also have an incredible educational uh, uh, infrastructure that will enable women and men, and especially our young women and men, to thrive, to learn, to have the opportunity to grow uh, and to realize their own potential. This is going to take all of us. It's not going to take just a, a year or two. It will take generations because we have been at a disadvantage for many years, but no more. I think Africa is a place now where everyone is thinking, how can we do business with Africa? Not we try to help Africa. It's going to be, it's going to be with, it's not for anymore, because I think for many years, uh, people have said, what can we do for Africa? I think uh, someone last time I was at uh, at SOCAP, and this was actually E, he's a Nigerian entrepreneur. He said, hey, hey, we are having this conversation differently. I think we need to change the question. It is not what you can do for Africa. It's what Africa can do for you. Mm -hmm. So that was such a wonderful way of putting it together because look, resources come from Africa and we continue to serve the world. I think it's about time that uh, Africa really reaps the benefit of the potential that it has. So uh, I think that's the future of Af what the future of Africa looks like to me. Um, yeah, no, no, not only resources, amazing talent. And that's what I want you to, uh, to ask you. What do you think that is working and is not working in the region for women entrepreneurs? So for women entrepreneurs, I think what's not working is 
there are no ecosystems like what you have that really, really can bring this opportunity. You're talking mm -hmm. about, I don't like to use the word disadvantage. I think these are more of the, the women that are uh, uh, running their business uh, under the table that nobody really sees what they're doing. They're not being looked at. And I think, how do we bring them out to the front? There's no such a thing as a disadvantaged person. Society simply makes you disadvantaged because they, they, uh, the, the system that was supposed to be in place is not there. But the people are, uh, they have, you know, women or men, we have our innate capacity to overcome our own challenges. The problem that I am seeing is the ecosystem doesn't exist in many, in many, many places. So why, uh, I, I mean, sometimes I have this, this, this crazy idea, why can't we disrupt the way in which we disrupted uh, the, the, the telephone system? And I know it's doing a lot of work. In fact, women are able to use mobile phone to transact businesses right now in any place, in most places in Africa. But at the same time, they're still not doing it at the level that we would like them to be. And I say this because you can, I don't like to sugarcoat the challenge that our people face on the continent or anywhere, even here, you know, in Silicon Valley, where I work to really help low-income families to gain economic self-sufficiency. I think what, what yeah. is missing is the ecosystem that can really bring them to the surface and give them the tools they need to thrive. And so if, for example, whether it's Heroica or others that are doing a similar thing, imagine if you can collaborate the and bring all these systems together and really tailor them region by region, country by country. Of course, it takes time, but we are meant to us. I think it's that strategic thinking, that long-term thinking. I don't care even if it takes hundreds of years, but we have to think it now, not tomorrow, to make these things happen. So I think there are barriers. And I, I believe these barriers were created by human being and human being can take them out too. And I and that's what gives me hope. And that's why I think we should continue to do this work. Um, you just said it. Uh, that's what we are planning. That's why we invited these uh, uh, women that we invited this year because we want to create these uh, strong collaborations. So we start netting this eco-friendly <laughs> environment for women entrepreneurs uh, curated, as you said that actually takes into consideration our needs. And so we can start telling institutions, governments, and also corporations uh, how they have to tailor their programs. Because right now, as you know, there's a huge gap between what we really need and what we are doing in our communities and what others think and how they're making the decisions for us. And uh, regarding that, don't worry, because I know that we're gonna collaborate but I wanted to ask you, what kind of programs um, do you offer at uh, the Africa Diaspora Network? Oh, I'm so glad you asked me because people think we're just uh, doing convening. So we have, you know, our first convening, which I'm actually going to put it on the chat because people I yes. would love for you to all come. The African Diaspora Investment Symposium, uh, the ninth is uh, next year, uh, March 20 to 22, uh, here in San Jose, in Silicon Valley, in the beautiful Hayes Mansion, so we do hope to see everybody. Um, we have out of the African Diaspora Investment Symposium that we started in 2016, which was the catalytic uh, uh, thing that we've ever done, uh, we created the Builders of Africa's Future. So the Builders of Africa's Future is um, uh, 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 an accelerator program that uh, looks at Africans um, uh, on the continent, uh, young women, men, uh, whoever wants to join. Um, and we provide them training, uh, mentoring. And of course, of course, the most beautiful thing that we're doing is providing each one of them $25,000 uh, to get at, uh, to as a way to support their ventures. 25,000 might not be enough, but it's good enough for our community. And so that is one of the things that we do and people can take a look at it. And if, there, if that's an interest, they can join. That's the sixth one. We're doing the sevens in 2024. Uh, uh, the other one, which I'm so excited about, is the accelerating Black leadership and entrepreneurship. Micah, this is very important. Uh, we never had a program, an accelerator program, for Black entrepreneurs in the United States. So when I say Black, I'm talking about the historical diaspora, which is African-Americans, and the contemporary diaspora, like myself, uh, uh, the uh, new immigrants uh, in the U.S. 
what this program has been do, uh, has done for us is really to support the diaspora and entrepreneurs in the US as well as the African Americans. And the bigger picture for me is we are bridging and we're bringing our community together, the historical, the African Americans and the Africans from the diaspora together. What could be better than that? Because we've never done, I mean, I, we have a cultural uh, difference. Uh, so what we're trying to do is, yep, yeah, that's great. We do have that difference. We have not uh, had their experience, which was uh, what I'm benefiting from. I always say that my life is possible because many African-Americans suffered for me. It cannot be any other way. Many immigrants are benefiting on the back of African-American suffering. And so that's something that I keep close to my heart so I don't become too... Um, uh, much uh, enamored with whatever the diaspora can do. But that is the truth. That's the reality. And so the question is, how do we bring this community together? You imagine, you know, we're only 2 million from the sub-Saharan African immigrants to the United States. But African-Americans are, but collectively with African-Americans, the diaspora is close to 30 million. It's incredible power, incredible power. I'm not saying 30 million of them will come to this platform. But that's fine if we can get a fraction of that even to be a part of what we're trying to think about. Uh, many things can change. And so I'm very, very excited about um, uh, the opportunity to work with uh, the uh, Black entrepreneurs in the U.S. as well as uh, builders of Africa's future, grassroots African entrepreneurs. This is uh, the most beautiful thing we've ever done. The last thing is we have a, a new initiative called the Beyond Remittances. What we're trying to do at ADN is we do remit, you know, uh, my car remittances go so far, uh, but it's also very transactional in a way. It's between me and my family and my friends. It doesn't really go straight to the very people that we're trying to uh, invest in. So what we're trying to figure out is can the diaspora also tap into our savings and start to really think about investment opportunities on the continent? That's going to be a long term and ongoing conversation, but it is already happening. It's just not happening at the level where you can feel it's a scalable. So uh, that's a, another uh, uh, initiative at ADN that we're pursuing. Uh, and this is why we're going to be collaborating in the near future, trying to give more visibility to all these initiatives. And I'm bringing also the Africa Diaspora Network to the ecosystem that we want to, to create for all the women entrepreneurs under Heroica and the Women Impact Summit. Um, final thoughts, Almas. What do oh, you want to share fine. with our community, oh, your community? Well, oh, my goodness, our global community, uh, women, if we can use our uh, voices, our sense of self for the greater good, things will change, really, really. But we should not use whatever power we have as a zero-sum game or as just me or nobody else. I think we need to share. Shifting power, there's a lot of talk about shifting power. I don't think it's the power that we need to shift for me anyway. I think we need to shift the energy. What is very important for us? We need mm -hmm. to focus on the things that are very important for our community, step away yeah. from it and start to really make an impact. I, for me, if I can use that shifting of my energy from the negative noise into doing something really meaningful into our community, one woman and one person at a time, regardless of how long it takes, I see women making an incredible difference first in ourselves because we have to take care of ourselves and then in our families, which is very critical. We, we, uh, we, we all have our own families and then our communities. And without that, I don't see myself moving anywhere, everywhere. Every time I wake up, I say, you know, I pray that I will be good to myself, to my family, my work and the community that I serve. And I think these things are not one or the other for me. They go hand in hand. Otherwise, I will get lost. And there's a lot of things to help uh, to make us distracted. I am as a mother in pain with what's going on in the Middle East. I grew up in Eritrea during war. So I know what war can do to people. I just pray that we will have the sense of humanity to think about little kids and, and, and elders and families and humanity as a whole to try to create a more sensible society. Otherwise, the way in which things run we can start something, but you may never be able to finish it. And I really, I mean, my heart bleeds for the people that are suffering around the world. And it's not me at this point. I'm just going to use my energy, whatever I have, whether it's for women. Imagine being a mother 
and your child is uh, taken away from you, regardless of where you are in the world. I think it's a painful thing. And I, I don't want to lose that sight because I don't want to be numb to what's happening in the world. I want to be present. I also, as I said, I want to use my energy for the good. Uh, Micah, my last point to you is keep doing what you're doing. Keep really, really putting your effort in what you believe in. And I have no doubt you will succeed. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity. And I look forward to our long-term collaboration. We're not far away from each other. So I look forward to seeing you. Um, Almas, thank you for warming always my heart and inspiring me, really. Oh, God. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you, Almas. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wow. Um, you know, I, I, I cannot help it. Every time I talk to Almas, I, I feel really my heart uh, gets extremely warm. The same way when I start seeing all of you super excited with our speakers. Um, we're going to continue with our climate change uh, um, uh, panel. I'm, I'm really excited to introduce to all of you our next uh, speakers. Um, uh, moderating this panel is going to be uh, Janelle Kelman. Uh, she is founder and CEO at the Center for Sea Rice Solutions. And let me tell you that she is one of the women that actually also uh, grabbed my hand and uh, uh, helped me walk the, the, this path to actually create Heroica and be with all of you today. So thank you, Janelle. I also want to introduce to you uh, Lauren um, uh, Willy, Global Head of uh, Sustainability and Social Impact at uh, Oliver uh, Wyman, Martha Cavazos, Project Director for Cavazos Consulting, Program Design Consultant with uh, Center for Sea Rice Solutions, Ocean X Education Initiative Consultant with Dalio Philanthropies, and Deidre Sanders, uh, Founder and Principal at uh, Art Spring Consulting. Welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us today at the Woman Impact Summit. Micah, thank you so much for having us. Um, huge congratulations to this incredible global event. I've been following the comments in the chat, and I'm just blown away to see women coming together from around the world. I know you've been working on this effort for a long time and your dedication and support is truly remarkable. So thank you for being a leader and thank you for giving us this opportunity. Uh, we've put together a panel here with three amazing uh, climate leaders, uh, obviously uh, female climate leaders here today to, to think about how we might, as Alma just mentioned, how we might play a huge role. How do we use our voices and sense of self for change and share and shift, not the power, as the last speaker said, but the energy in the room. And so uh, it is my honor and my pleasure to introduce to you uh, three amazing uh, speakers today. Uh, Martha Vasos uh, will be our, our first to, to present. Uh, Martha and I have worked together now for a handful of years, and I can tell you uh, with personal experience how much she prioritizes leadership development and connections to create a more just and sustainable world. Martha has over 10 years of experience in curriculum and program design. She leads the strategy and implementation of climate-focused workshops, events, curriculums, with a focus on equity uh, in, in the climate crisis. Um, Martha has worked across local and global teams, including the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, uh, Challenge Detroit, via uh, Chrysler Automobiles, and more recently, my own organization, the Center for Sea Rise Solutions. So welcome to Martha. Um, Lauren Wiley, uh, our second speaker, is the Global Head of Sustainability and Social Impact for Oliver Wyman, a global strategy consulting firm. Lauren leads Oliver Wyman's work to meet its net zero target, and she oversees the company's social impact, volunteering, and fundraising programs worldwide. Lauren also serves on the SOS Leader Sustainability Commission uh, and is on the board of directors for the nonprofit EarthShare. And as uh, many of you know, I was the mayor of SOS Leader last year, so Martha and I, uh, pardon me, uh, Lauren and I have been able to work together for many years uh, as well. And last but certainly not least, uh, a former colleague of mine, Deirdre Sanders. Welcome, Deirdre. Dr. Deirdre Sanders is the founder and principal of Arc Spring Consulting, which focuses on guiding industry, regulators, and non-governmental organizations concerned with climate change in the adoption 
and implementation of policies and practices that will ensure an equitable transition to clean energy. She has over 20 years of experience working in the utility industry on environmental justice concerns and is recognized as a nation, nationwide and global expert really on environmental justice. So welcome, Deirdre. Um, the conversation today is really going to be focused on how we adjust our mindset to recognize that climate is really everything from here on out. And so we're going to start with Martha. Uh, and Martha, why don't you tell us how you came to add climate leadership lens to your work? Yeah, thank you, Janelle. And thank you, Deirdre and Lauren, for, for joining me. And it's just so incredible to be here today with women from all over the world. Um, you know, I have grown up as a swimmer and uh, as an ocean lover. And so the connection to the water and to this planet has always just been something that I've really personally cared about. And as uh, over the last couple of years, I have grown to just continue to focus on creating a more sustainable and equitable future for all living beings in this planet. And uh, through my work with the leadership development, I have I know that we all have a role to play in this climate crisis to make this future possible. So, you know, whether you are a new entrepreneur or a seasoned leader, the world and the climate crisis is changing so much. We need new tools, resources, practices and community to really step into how we lead and do this uh, work for the future. And my journey really started, you know, first as a swimmer, <laughs> a really little growing up, but then in the social impact sector, working with a lot of different nonprofits and corporate engagement. And I started to see, you know, where we could be making more impact and where we could be more efficient and where we were starting to stray a little bit from our values as teams and organizations. And I, I really started to wonder what that meant for creating a more sustainable future. Um, and by way of a couple of different leadership focused conferences and trainings, I began to, um, to learn that leadership really intersects at each of these points. And climate leadership specifically ensures that we have a shared responsibility to our planet and really helps us focus on how we make this responsibility actionable, how our work and our businesses um, can continue to take us into the future. And so, um, you know, how I've arrived here today, you know, in the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to work at Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Um, I ran the Ocean Solutions Accelerator Program, where we were able to provide not only entrepreneurial business development, pitch training, investment training to ocean tech solutions all over the world, but also executive leadership coaching. Um, and this included models for how we navigate conflict, how we expand and grow teams, how your team can strategically set priorities to ensure that these businesses, these really important ocean tech solutions can be successful because we need these uh, businesses to be successful for the long haul. You know, over more specifically at the Center for CRI Solutions with Janelle today, we approach leadership in our trainings and workshops as cross-sector and inclusive. So when developing our workshops for building more coastal resilience, we always consider what leaders are we missing and who needs to be in the room. So I really, you know, believe that this interdisciplinary approach, this cross-sector approach is essential, not only when we're driving more change, but to also have a community along the way too. Um, and so, you know, my journey to, to answer your question, Janelle, and, and some really started by kind of my own personal connection to the water. I live in Detroit on the Great Lakes and right near the river and the international waterways here. Um, grew up in New Jersey, right on the beach as well. And a traveled to a number of places around the world to be in and near the water. Um, and so kind of feeling that personal joy and connection in these this water and these spaces, applying leadership and climate leadership um, to work um, has been part of the journey. And um, I'm really excited to talk to you all today about how you can begin to identify yourself as a climate leader um, to say, yes, climate is important to me. I have a role to play. My team, my company has a role to play, um, and we can we can do this work together. And I know Deirdre and Lauren are going to share with you a little bit more about what that can can look like as well, too. Thank you, Martha. I I so love this message of, about feeling so connected to where you are, the sense of place, and then really wanting to provide for your local community, but on a global level. And I think that's 
really characterizes a lot of the work that you've been doing in your career. So thank you for sort of setting up this, this conversation. Um, Lauren, uh, you know, talking about sense of place, we're both in Sausalito, California, which is right outside of San Francisco, um, but your work is also nationwide and global. And uh, you've offered to talk to us a little bit about uh, sustainability lens. And there's a lot of talk now, sustainability, resilience, are those things the same? Are they different? Um, so I, I turn it over to you to share a little bit about your climate journey and how you came towards the sustainability space. Yeah, sure. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, you nailed it, Janelle. The terminology in this space is entirely too confusing. We have too much work to do to be focused on you know, what individual words mean. But the fact is, this is a very new in huge challenging space. And there's often a lot of confusion right at the outset about what people are doing. And so in my world, you could call it corporate sustainability. My job is to make sure that my company walks the talk. You hear about corporate commitments all the time, net zero commitments, commitments to society and fundraising goals. It means nothing if it's just words. You have to action it. And you have to action it in a way that engages everybody. Uh, you know, in our last speaker was talking about collaboration. I handle, you know, so many different things now than I did 15 years ago when I started this. But back then, it started as a table of people, often women, sitting around saying, what, how, how do we do this? And that's what's beautiful about this sustainability space is that we are all growing and learning together and we're collaborating together to make this happen. So in terms of what I do, essentially I'm, you know, there, there's a lot that a company can do to be more sustainable. Depends on what you do. It's, it's a big deal for manufacturers, heavy emitters. It's perhaps less so for a smaller company that doesn't have a big carbon footprint, but everyone has a common denominator here. Any company, any organization, it requires behavior change. It be requires behavior change as individuals to get where we need to go. And so a lot of my work is really tapping into what makes that happen. And that's connecting with stories, connecting with inspiration. You asked how I got started here, Janelle. I won an essay contest in 2005, sorry, 2008, that sent me to Antarctica. It was simply at a time, it was, it was a perk for my company, said, go on a leadership expedition. They didn't realize that I would be, you know, get a light bulb moment that, that would change my life. And I came back and I said, I'm, I'm going to change my career to do this and, and, the last 15 years have been about building that. And thankfully, my company was supportive in letting me do that. But it meant building relationships and saying, listen, I know you've been doing one thing a certain way for 20 years. I'm going to ask you to do it differently. In my case, it's really about business travel. As consultants, that's what we do. We get on planes and we serve our clients. And it's also a reason people join our company. They want to see the world. That's going to have to change. And so my work is all about being able to do what we need to do to serve our clients, to make our employees happy and excited to be here, but let's do it a little less. Sometimes it just comes down to a simple behavior change rather than pointing fingers and, and being confrontational. It's about finding what, what it means to them and, and offering them some other things that, that they can get excited about. And, and Lauren, I just want to follow up. You were at New York Climate Week this year, and you sent um, sort of notes from the field, which were excellent. And you you made the point that it's no longer just about this phrase, this term sustainability. It's the future of society. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll circle back on that. I want to. I'm going to ask, uh, what are some shifts you've seen? Uh, from the corporate perspective, from the on the ground perspective. But uh, let's get to, to Deirdre. Um, and Deirdre, we've known each other actually a very long time. We used to work together uh, at a utility. And so thank you for, for coming and sharing your thoughts here. Um, so excited to hear more about the work you're doing on environmental justice and equity. Uh, you have deep, deep experience 
in uh, the energy space. And these issues are starting to uh, come together in a big way uh, in the state of California and, of course, uh, across the nation. So I don't want to uh, give away uh, what you're about to share with us. So I'll just hand it over to you and, and look forward to your insight. Yes, thank you, Janelle. And um, my pleasure to be here on this panel with you and with Lauren and with Martha. And thank you for Aroica for uh, putting this together for us. Uh, it is... There, there are no signpost or maps to get to this work. Um, a lot of us sort of stumble and fumble our way through, and then we we look around and find ourselves in a place that, well, for me, that was unexpected given where I'd started. So I'm a, I'm my background is policy, international public policy. Um, I came to it through a, a problem solving. Uh, lens and um, to make a, a condense my story, uh, make it as succinct as possible. Um, I, I credit my parents for giving me the, the problem solving mindset. My parents grew up in the segregated South um, at a time where they've got a lot of no's and you can't and people like you don't. And, and um, my father in particular was a I understand that you don't want me to, but I want to. And so therefore I will find a way, usually an unconventional way to get to where I need to be. And I think a lot of us here at the, the Women Impact uh, Conference may find ourselves in a lot of those circumstances as well. So how, how to negotiate from where you are to where you'd like to be, or maybe you don't know where you want to be. <laughs> you just know you don't want to be where you are. So how do you how do you how do you discover that? For me, coming to the climate work as a policy problem solver, um, I thought I was going to go into urban planning initially. Had an internship in graduate school that put me in a local government situation, and because I was the least cost resource as a student intern, they sent me to the regulatory. Uh, um, meetings where policy was was going to be discussed on how local resources were going to be shared, distributed to address stormwater runoff or solid waste disposal. Um, and I looked around these rooms and realized often I was the only person of color there, the only black person there. And the decisions that were going to be made were going to affect my communities, but we weren't part of the people there making the decisions. So this started me on environmental justice um, and also leading to, uh, with the rise of, of the climate uh, uh, movement uh, to climate justice. And what does it mean to be equitable in this space? Lots of questions. Um, when we talk about, for example, another E word instead of equity is efficiency, economic efficiency. A lot of decisions are made because we're told they're economically efficient, but efficient for whom? Whose priorities are, are uh, decided um, to be pursued or, or worthy of investment um, to the benefit of whom? And are these decisions uh, based on, let's say, least cost? How, ma how many units or how many things can I accomplish or satisfy with the same amount of money? Or is it a priority to decide who has the most need? They might not be the same people. They often are not. So if it is economically efficient to serve those with the least need because you can you can distribute the money farther, is that really accomplish your goal? Is that really the priority you should have? I just say that because these are things that these are questions for me that drove my interest in climate equity and starting to ask questions around um technology and who's going to what what technologies are going to be 
uh, favored and advanced. Why? By whom? Uh, is it for investors? Is it for the, the users or the consumers of this good or product? Is it um, for systemic change? Uh, these are areas that the big questions at the policy level that influence where we might go. What that would mean, I would think, for a local entrepreneur um, that wants to participate in the transition from um, fossil fuels to cleaner energy, um, there are parts of our communities here in the United States, there are some communities and beyond the U.S. shores where um, it's not appropriate for a, a man who is not a member of that family to go to that home, to go to a home. And so this is an opportunity, in my view, for women to start small businesses, maybe doing energy efficiency or uh, home assessments to decide what infrastructure, what um, build out add-ons do um, our homes need to make them more comfortable for us, for our families, to make them more livable, to make them more healthful in terms of the, the type of energy we use and how we use it. And the, the previous discussion with uh, Amaz uh, Nagash, where she was saying, you know, this is part of the conversation of informing uh, those in positions to, to decide where investments go and for the benefit of whom. I think having women inform those decisions, like these are the things we need in our homes to make them work better, use energy better, um, have better access to energy. And so this is space for women that I think uh, have a lot of possibilities in terms of uh, having the social capacity to go to each other's homes and to talk about what we need within our homes to, to um, make them more energy uh, accessible and efficient, but also I think this could lead to so many other doors, like literal inner innovation in terms of things that we use in our homes or how our homes work. Not someone deciding this equipment should go to you because I know how to make it. And therefore I'm gonna to try to figure out how to get you to use it or buy it. But me coming to designers and saying, I have a new design, I have a new way. So I'll stop talking there. Uh, I think you've gotten the uh, fire hose version of big funnel down to like a smaller uh, application in maybe five minutes. So there we go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. And I really want to amplify what you just said. Climate is a space for women and it is a place where we can and should lead for so many good reasons understanding the everyday life of our families and our communities, but also our ability to drive consensus and collaboration and do it in a way that has meaningful impact. Um, that is, is such an underlying and foundational force for equity and change. So I, I hear you and I, I want to amplify what you just said. Um, and I also want to circle back and I saw an, a question in the, uh, in the chat about the shift in attitude. And uh, the question was, was, I think, maybe aimed towards upcoming COP uh, meeting. But, you know, how is the space shifting now? What have you seen that is different? And so, so we'll circle back now to we'll go to Lauren and then Martha and Deirdre to answer that question. But what, kind of, what are some changes that you've seen um, through the course of your work that could help this community understand how to play a bigger role in, in the climate crisis? So, Lauren, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think Janelle, it boils down to what we started this conversation about, which is, you know, what we call the the lens, the sustainability lens, which is what are you going to be doing with this new business? Have you applied a sustainability lens to look at the opportunity as well as the negative impact and, and make some changes before you go out there? But also, have you applied the equity lens? I think for the first time you referenced Climate Week, 
last September, um, this past September, uh, I've been going to these conferences for years. And this was the first time that it wasn't just a side panel that talked about climate justice, environmental justice, the global South, the need for us all to collaborate. It was every single panel. And that to me was a, a clear shift from fringe thinking to it's it's just what needs to happen. And that's why, you know, in those takeaways um, that you referenced, I, I talked about that being my most uh, my most noticeable shift. I think also we're starting to talk about things like insurance more, things that really can't uh, change from the big global aspect in terms of new technologies and businesses shifting out of fossil fuels. You, you've got to be able, with all of our climate change creating these big storms, the amount of money that is that is being lost by everyone, small businesses, large businesses alike, Unless that's all underpinned by insurance and we figure out how to do that, we're going to be in trouble. And and it also probably shouldn't just be the insurance companies to just pay for everything. We need to figure out all of this together. Um, it's, it's tricky, uh, complex work, but I've been encouraged, especially in the last two years uh, of how this is moving. That would be my view on, on the shifts that I'm observing. That makes a lot of sense. And it's also really incredible to see things that have started out as small gatherings really blossom into powerful movements. Um, Martha, I know you and I actually uh, have been working together for a couple of years, but we first met in, in Lisbon, in Portugal. So of course you, you have that broader uh, global point of view as well. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, absolutely. That's what first kind of came to mind for me being much closer to the ocean and education and coastal resilience space. It's been really exciting to see a change in attention um, on a global and policy level. For example, we can see a lot of policy shifting um, internationally around the ban, the, uh, ban on deep sea mining um, that's happening in the movement that's growing in that space. And then, you know, looking at the UN decade on, on the ocean specifically, there's a big transformation happening in the push to shift ocean literacy, which has been one of the most underfunded sciences across the world. Um, and so it's it's really exciting to see the attention that the ocean is finally getting as a catalyst for change um, and a possibility for um, new uh, ways of harnessing um, this, this and moving through this climate crisis as well too. Um, I think even more specifically in the United States, you know, where I am based here in Michigan, we've had a lot of challenges here with air quality and pollution um, that's changed a lot just in this last year. And so I think this uh, shift is also becoming more personal. And so when I think about climate leadership, you know, you heard me talk about our own connection and using that as a way to kind of an access into thinking about how we apply sustainability and climate equity to this space. And so um, I think that's also just a, a big transformation. You know, this the climate space has been dominated by um, males for far too long. And so I think, you know, being here today in this gathering and talking about climate in and of itself is a huge marker of this shift um, with women from all over the world. So, you know, we have plenty of solutions. We need to be more strategic and intentional in how we move those solutions forward as, as leaders. And so really excited to see how that goes. And I hope we can continue to focus on our oceans and our waterways as a catalyst for that too. Yeah, thank you for that, Martha. Um, you know, I was going to turn to Deirdre with the same question, but I'm seeing some really interesting dialogue happening in the chat. And one of the things that, that I'm seeing here is sort of an acknowledgement about the role that women can play. You know, women obviously being the primary caregivers of the, of the children and, and the folks in the house in many parts of the world, um, but don't have the same access to resources, uh, access to capital, access to education, access to training. And that, of course, is 
an environmental justice issue. It's an equity issue. And so, Deirdre, I'm going to bring that over to you and say and ask you for some thoughts on how we can potentially increase access to opportunity. And, and I'll leave it to you to define what opportunity uh, is. But how might we we help women around the world have more access um, and be able to to take uh, you know take steps to make change in their community and, and more globally? Uh, thank you, Janelle, for for giving me the hot potato. The the hot <laughs> yeah, that's the yeah. Um, but but a a very good question, um, because uh, equity we can talk about equity, but if you don't have access, if you don't have access to resources, to knowledge, um, to to even have the um, agency over your own life over large parts of what's going to affect you, it becomes difficult. But one of the areas that women tend to have more influence and control over around the world is at home, which is what I mentioned before. But one of the things I, I just want to say about equity, there are a lot of E words. So equity, a shift that I've seen, I do want to address that is we the the models that we use the economic models that we use are very extractive and very concentrated into how do i extract this thing maybe it's a natural resource transform it into a good which creates a lot of waste in the process and then sell it at a price that is going to give me a profit and that is how i create wealth for myself um, when we talk about equity, though, it's more about how do we ensure that our economic systems and cycles are creating space for other people to get, for, for everyone to get what they need. And what a lot of our conversation has been up to this point, and I'm starting to see a shift, is what do we mean when we say inclusion? Are we incl being inclusive in terms of the wealth development of this new system process or good? Or are we being inclusive in the cost of producing this thing? I'm hearing much more about the latter for inclusiveness and less about the former. This is not equitable. We can't just be, we wanted, we want to share the burdens with everyone. We all are in this together. Yay. But when it comes to the benefits, the innovation, the um investment payout, the investment opportunity, that tends to be closed. And Thank so, God. and so when we talk about women having access to funding, women having access to decision makers, women having access to influence, if we can't build it ourselves, at least to influence the thing that eventually is going to come back to us, wanting us to use it, participate and endorse it. Um, so let, let me, let me, you know, let me pause you there. Cause I'm getting the, the two minute sign. Oh, on, okay. Uh, done, uh, done, done, done. <laughs> But but thank you and and I, I appreciate that that perspective because access is everything and having a seat at the table and one of the things I love about Micah is that she doesn't wait for someone to invite her to have a seat at the table she creates her own and I think that's something we can all collectively do and and support one another um, so let me just uh, ask you I, two minutes left one minute each for Lauren and and Martha Lauren final thoughts yeah two things one. You don't, I, I was a theater major. I didn't, I didn't get educated on any of this. I, I just figured it out along the way. So no matter what you have grown up learning and no matter what your business is, it's never too late to apply this lens and to change the direction of the work that you do to influence, to positively influence the environment. Um, the second thing is just a resource um, I've I've worked with in the past, Kiva.org. You might have heard of it before, K-I-V-A.org. It's microfinance. 
helping individuals uh, get their their companies and projects funded through crowdsourcing. So just one idea to leave you with and best of luck to everyone. Really, really happy to have spent this time with you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Martha. Yeah, I'll build off of that, you know, Lauren, to to your point, you know, you don't need to be a scientist or a policy expert, your lived experience in climate change is valid and essential to to do the work that's required. Um, and and lean on your your, your weak ties, your loose connection. So all these people at this summit here today, are people that can help move your next idea, um, or, or uh, change the level of access that you might have as well to some of these resources. So my advice is also to have a, a clear ask for how people in this community can be supportive of you. And i um, really excited. Thank you again for having us here today. Thank you all. Wonderful panel. And Micah, thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for all the participants. So we'll hand it back over to you. Thank you to all of you. And please, uh, I can't wait to see you in person and meet you in person so we can continue building this long, long, long table that we already started. Thank you so much, Janelle, uh, Lauren, Marta, and Deirdre. Thank you so much. And we're going to continue um, with uh, this uh, a special session. Um, I have a soft spot for this session because uh, it's when we uh, always show um, the work of uh, the women uh, from around the world uh, through our platform from Heroica. Uh, we always do an open call. And this year, um, let me introduce you to the following entrepreneurs. We are really proud and super happy uh, of the work that they're doing in their um, regions and in their communities. Um, we will start with um, Oluwasum Ovadam, co-founder and CEO at Arso Farms. Uh, Enfile Jelane, founder and managing director at um, is a Maswe Education Center for Innovation. Uh, Habiba Juma, Executive Director and Founder at Soraya, Nurturing Young Teens and Females. Um, she will be followed by November Canieso Geo, Founder at Plantsville Health and Chief Champion of the Philippine Cinema. And the last one would be uh, Kevaniwe Julia. Gaga Medi, founder and CEO at Dudes and Diva Couture, PTY Limited. Hello, everyone. My name is Olua Shion Obadan. I am from Lagos, Nigeria, and I am the founder of Arso Farms Limited. We are an agro ally company that provides access and convenience to greens, especially our African leafy vegetables, thereby reducing the pervasive challenge of post-harvest loss. It's our goal that more people consume vegetables, and this is the reason why we do what we do. My story is very unique, as I am an architect by training. However, in the year 2019, I encountered an illness which was later diagnosed as anemia. During this time, my mom resolved to juicing greens for me and this recovered my health very quickly. I was able to discover the healing powers and the potency of greens, especially our African leafy vegetables. And I set out to make, it, make them more convenient for people in order to increase the consumption. So far in the last two years, we have created our business around green beverages and ready to use packaged fresh greens. This has enabled over 1,500 customers have access to this and improve their health and their well-being. It has been an exciting journey for us. Beyond business as usual, our partnership with over 20 local female farmers have enabled them increase their earnings. And now people like Madam F. Ati can now take her son, Simeon, through tertiary institution. 
it's a win-win for us at all ends our goal right now is to produce and launch our export worthy products which will be Africa's foremost super green powder made from our heritage greens we're very excited about this product and we have gone ahead to start selling our formulated combined greens as packaged greens for people to include in their smoothies and they have been our best seller so far selling over 2,000 packs in less than two years and now we want to make them greens on the go my ask today is for 50,000 US dollars that would help us set up our operations and our production line it will also serve as working capital and help us kickstart marketing my belief is that you will not just be inspired by my green story but you would also be excited about the potential of this green powder for your health thank you very much Hello everyone, I'm so excited to be telling you about our project as Amaze Education Center for Innovation. My name is Mpile Yelani. I'm the founder of Eza Maze and also a qualified economic analyst by profession. When I launched the Eza Maze Education Center for Innovation in 2022, my goal was simple, make quality learning resources accessible for everyone, including those in communities outside the big cities, make learning fun for the, for the younger ones, and enable skills for holistic human development for the unemployed youth and women. So I decided uh, to focus on education development solutions to reduce poverty. Our project is based in the Limpopo province, one of the poorest provinces in the country with high number of school dropout. 70% of the youth is unemployed, 80% of women uh, cannot find jobs as the province is saturated by uh, industries such as mining, agriculture, factories, and professional services will mostly hire the fully qualified. About 82% of job seekers have given up on finding jobs. And this is when I decided that unless the population is educated, it will take us longer to achieve sustainable economic development. And that is when I decided that Ezamazo will become a catalyst for change and create programs uh, that accelerate uh, that accelerates uh, and promotes sustainable economic growth in local communities. We have uh, projects, but our core project, uh, early literacy, digital literacy, financial literacy, skills development programs, enterprise development, and STEM. This is when we wanted to make a holistic impact in communities that do not generally gain access to economic activities. We envision Ezamaz as a catalyst for education development in Africa. We intend to do this because we understand that access to, uh, we know that access to quality learning resources opens up imaginations into a new world. We want the, everyone who's in contact with Ezamaz to imagine themselves as leaders, engineers, catalyst for change in their own communities and we do this by giving them access to uh, right resources teach them how to read write and tell stories while they're still young as you can see in the picture for a grade one in the middle we invite professionals to come engage and motivate the, uh, our our learners to give them a true representation of what success is and what they need to do to choose the right careers from them themselves. When they are within as Amazo Education Center for Innovation, we give them resources so that they learn to do their own research independently. And from this, they learn to start solving local economic, socio-economic uh, challenges we're having as a country. Like on the picture, they were presenting, presenting a solution on food security. Our objective is clear. We want to make quality education accessible. We, we, we give skills that enables decent jobs. 
uh, we make access to ICT, innovation technology coding, uh, to, uh, to close the gap in digital equity and promote youth and women empowerment. Since we started in 2020, we have been making strides. And in 2022, we were honored by the inaugural National Presidential SME Awards as top three township-based SME of the year. And in 2023, this year, we were honored by MTN as they were selecting 10 women that are making impact in tech uh, business in the country. We were one of those that were selected and we became top 10, top 10 tech entrepreneurs for MTN. We're looking forward to engage with you because we seek equitable solutions and universal access to knowledge economy. We can only do this when we have a community such as you who will donate old laptops, smartphones, tablets, books, learning resources so that we make them accessible so they can learn how to do coding themselves. They can learn how to, uh, they can be introduced to uh, doing their own research independently. All this make education fun because we want to support students um, so that we can accelerate and help prepare children, youth, women, startup and active employment seekers through life and communication skills, equip citizens to meet, to meet life challenges in a globally competitive uh, world. Let's engage. We would love to partner with you. Do not forget to send me a WhatsApp. Uh, there is my number on the screen. Uh, send me an email. We're also available on, on, on social media as Ezamazo Education Center for Innovation because we believe that a pathway to sustainable and inclusive socioeconomic development entails initiatives that promote early recovery and community re uh, resilience. We can do this when we have you joining our platform, engaging with us. So I'm looking forward to learning from you and also engaging with you. And we share ideas on how us as women, we can change the world. Thank you so much. Greetings everyone. My name is Habiba Juma from Kenya, founder and executive director of Soraya Nurturing Teen Moms and Female. Soraya is a transformative community-based organization that was founded in 2020 to basically create opportunities for girls to be agents of change. Through our, through our trainings, we bring girls from different slums across the country uh, to get skills and um, to get skills and uh, rebuild relationship with their parents due to uh, them getting pregnant before finishing school. Why we do this? Um, the main reason we do this and the main reason we exist is to help reduce the cases of teenage pregnancy in our country and also uh, try to empower girls who are still in school to know the importance of, of, of education and also um, get to understand the consequences of getting pregnant before finishing school. Who we do with? Uh, our main focus is in two categories. The first category uh, is the teenage moms, girls who have dropped out of school, either in primary or high school. We, we look for opportunity to take them back to school or the ones who are not, uh, they are not interested going back to school. We bring them together, give them various skills to be able to, to be confident enough to apply for employment opportunity or even start their business. The second category is the school school kids, both boys and girls. So for them, uh, we do mentoring and um, empowering program whereby we empower them and mentor them the importance of education and also try to teach them to know the consequences of getting pregnant before finishing school. How we do this, we our main three SDGs focus are good, good health and well-being, quality education, decent work and economic growth. And through our training, we, we, we focus on different areas uh, by delivering the classes in our in our program. Uh, one of the one of the areas we focus on is personal development to help the girls understand and be self-aware of their understand of their environment and also take charges and take opportunities that are around them. The second one is the entrepreneurship and uh, digital literacy. Then the third one, it's a reproductive well-being. 
which is under the SDG of good health, of good health and uh, well-being. We have also other activities incorporated to the to the to the program. The ones that we give them skills on the ones that we give them tangible skills like crocheting and baking. Where we are, uh, we are based in two slums in Kenya, which are the main slums, uh, namely Kibera and Madare. And uh, our first cohort started in Madare, whereby we work with uh, um, 30 teen moms who joined the program and got the, the skills that we offer, and also work with uh, 30 uh, girls who are still in school just to empower them and mentor them during their holidays and also during the time that they were in school. In 2021, we relocate back to Kibera, open another branch, and uh, we worked with uh, uh, 30 teen moms who went through our training program and um, it was it was super awesome. Uh, last year, 2020, 2022, we worked with also 30 teen moms uh, who went uh, through our six month um, training program and also we did training with 50 women in Kibra uh, whereby we tackle areas like menstrual health, reproductive health and contraceptive. And we did a couple of sessions with them and also try to and uh, to try to 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 rebuild relationship of uh, with their daughters who have got pregnant before finishing school. Where we are planning to go? Uh, we are planning to at least work um, next year with six sitting moms. Uh, this year we we are working. Our current cohort is um, uh, we have forty teen moms, uh, both uh, twenty in Kibera and uh, twenty in uh, Madare. Who, who are going through our six months training program and they are currently um, almost graduating uh, in the in the first weekend of uh, December. And where we are planning to go next year is to work with at least 60 teen moms to increase the number to at least 60, whereby we will work with 30 teen moms in both Kibera and Madare. Uh, we are also planning to do um, various, various activities and uh, we're also um, planning to enhance our training program by touching different areas where the, where, where, whereby we believe that uh, opportunities that they can use to build their life and also get um, employment opportunity to be able to support their kids and also support themselves. Uh, we have, uh, through our program, uh, we have uh, quite amazing stories that you can also check our, on, our, on our social media handle. And one of the success stories is that um, when they are done with their training program, we would source for help to try and fund them to start their businesses for those who are interested with business. And for those who are not interested with business, we look for opportunities for them, like internship program, just to connect them to get skills that they can be confident enough and uh, get something out of it to be able to support themselves and also uh, support their, their, their kids. Uh, we also um, connect them to more advanced uh, um, skills offered by other organizations just to help them build their skills and also grow. For those who are, who are still passionate about what we do and they want to give back to the community, we onboard them to the team and they join us and we work together. From the first picture you can see, this is our graduation last year and also the second one. These are among the teen moms who graduated from the six months um, training program and it was very, very good. And you could see um, the change in, uh, in them from the time they joined and also the time they graduated. How you can get involved or work with us. Um, we are seeking support to sponsors who can either help um, some of the teen moms to go back to school or support a cohort by providing, um, by help to provide um, the various resources needed for the, for, the, for the training period per cohort. And also you can support the, the teen moms by maternal health um, care fee, or even support us in, uh, in paying the, the space that we are using for, for our training. Uh, we also call out volunteers and mentors and coaches who are willing to work with us because the girls need a lot of mentors who can encourage them and be their role model. We welcome um, you on board for, for this kind of opportunity. We also accept um, merchandise donations like sanitary towels, clothes, office equipments, computers, 
and also things that can 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 be used to in our training program also uh, lastly um we request uh, for those who have funds or they have part-time job or online job that um, they have they are looking for people our graduates have the best skills and they can they can they can do it and we, we would like to put them um to challenge them to to try and take this opportunity to grow themselves those are my presentation thank you so much you can check out uh, our website is soraya.co.ke and also follow our instagram page facebook twitter and uh, linkedin and also on our instagram page we have a campaign for for the current cohort and the next year cohort coming um we have a go and me campaign uh, you can get uh, the link on our profile thank you so much thank you Herikas, for this opportunity thank you everyone who have uh, listened to my presentation and thank you so much um for this platform i appreciate and i'm grateful bye Hello, I'm November Cañesoyo, Chief Champion for the Philippine Cinnamon. Our company exists for conservation, livelihood, health, and climate change mitigation. We are in a climate emergency, and the Philippines, with a 114 million population, is now ranked number one in the World Risk Index. We expect a rising sea levels, flooding, and extreme drought. The most vulnerable are the marginalized, like the farmers in Don Salvador Benedicto, Negros Occidental Philippines, who earn only $91 per month, and true also for 3 million smallholder farmers, because of many reasons, among which poor soil, occurrences of typhoon, and too much heat due to climate change. This makes eating healthy difficult for Filipinos, such that 42 million have hypertension and 4 million have diabetes. Thus, it is clear why many aim at the Philippines for reforestation. Here comes the good news. The Philippines has 21 native species of the Philippine cinnamon. The trees absorb carbon and are anti-hypertension and anti-diabetes and can provide a livelihood. We have gained traction and impact through the years. In our pilot site, we raised awareness of 350 farmers, so they stopped making charcoal out of the Philippine cinnamon trees and saved 50 remaining mother trees of the Philippine cinnamon. 76 farmers have sold 14,000 and were paid 9,000 US dollars, raised by Plantsville from the local government unit. 5,000 Philippine cinnamon trees in varying heart are currently standing and leaves grow back two to three times after each harvest. We've reached 760,000 through various media and we found seven Philippine cinnamon species in one pilot site. We found 22 chemical compounds like eugenol, linalool, and caryphylene, which are used in food, medicine, and cosmetics. We developed a protocol to root cuttings to propagate in thousands. And instead of charcoal, we developed six high-value products that were bought by 500 customers. We distributed the U.S. and in the Philippines and in a premium grocery chain. We built our manufacturing facility and have registered it to the Philippine FDA and US FDA that enable us to export and sell in retail chains. We migrate to Oracle ERP to ensure that we are aligned with international practice for good governance. We built a 100 kg distiller and are currently building a 200 kg distiller and a 100 kg solar tunnel dryer in a distillation facility compliant to good manufacturing practice, both funded by the Department of Science and Technology. A patent utility model for the Philippine cinnamon essential oil and a pending application for hydrosol and sleep aromatic water. The patent covers all of the 21 Philippine cinnamon species. We have a signed memorandum of understanding with Wright Med of Unilab for research towards product and market development. Unilab distributes its products globally and it is the largest pharmaceutical in the Philippines and the second largest in Southeast Asia. And to secure and see the raw materials in real time efficiently, we have a prototype monitoring technology for large scale cinnamon and aromatic plantations all over the Philippines. The technology can also monitor other crops. 
be discussed with different groups to replicate in other parts of the Philippines, and we are ready to accelerate. We are looking for a carbon offset mentor and partner who shares our values, who could champion our service to plant trees to offset carbon and engage communities, our brand and our products, and who has experience in working with a woman-led business and can connect with our target market. We want to tap into the reforestation market for carbon offset to achieve a sustainable business model. Plantsville is in a unique space among our competitors and it really does take a village. So we take an ecosystem approach and partnered with key contributors. And to market, we need to tap into the network of reputable orgs. To end, we go back to the smallholder farmer with social and technological innovation we raise her awareness on the presence and opportunities of the Philippine cinnamon, change her business model on the tree so it sustainably gives her livelihood. So she herself becomes a guardian and champion of the Philippine cinnamon to fight climate change. Let's talk. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Keba Julia Karamedi. I'm a fashion designer from Jutes and Divas Koto. We are based in Botswana. We are in Mau. We are a clothing manufacturing company. We manufacture PPE, uniforms, safari wear, corporate clothing, and textile products. We market our business by using business cards, brochures, Facebook, TikTok, WhatsApp, Instagram, and we also attend trade shows where we display our products. Our target customers are the government, schools, safari companies, private institutions, and individuals. I started this company in 2017 because I was unemployed. Unemployment is very high in our country, so women and youth are struggling to take care of themselves, take care of their, their families. So I started this, I started this company so that I can employ myself and employ other people. This and Divas Koto right now is operating with seven people. So there's a high demand of PPE in our country because we have mines, we have construction projects that are ongoing in our country. So there was a high demand of PPE. That is why I opened this company so that we can manufacture PPE. There's also high demand in school uniforms in our country. There's also high demand of safari wear because we have so many, we are, we, where I am based, it's a tourist town. So there are so many tourist companies or safari companies who needs our service. So we are making uniforms for them. Dudes and Divas Couture needs a, a space of their of our own where we can operate because rent is one of the most expensive thing in business that it's affecting our business so if we get a, a business plot where we can expand we can increase our production which also enable us to increase the employment rate we will move from seven people to 25 people our contact numbers are two plus two six seven seven one two four four six eight one and plus two six seven seven four three one nine two nine six. Thank you very much. Amazing projects. I don't know. I'm super proud of all of our Heroica. So, and I've been following all of your projects. Our soft farms is a mass aware education center um, for innovation. Also, Soraya. Uh, I've been also following Dutz and Diva and, of course, uh, Plantsville Health. So, thank you so much for all the work that you do in your communities. And hopefully, uh, we will find uh, people listening that might uh, help you out with uh, what you're looking for as well. And um, we're going to continue with uh, another amazing speaker. As you see today on our third day, we keep bringing you amazing speakers. Hi, Sarah. I already see her there. <laughs> and uh, um, there are many words that can describe uh, Sarah. Resilience, curiosity, creativity, 
servant leader. Um, this past September, she received the CEO of the Year in Innovation Award during the HR Innovation Summit. Congratulations, by the way. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to all of you, Sarah Harmon, CEO at Singular. How are you today? I'm great, Micah. How are you? Good, good. Extremely happy to see you. And uh, I, well, I, I am want so everyone... proud and privileged that you guys invited me to speak here. And after seeing these amazing women entrepreneurs, I actually came in early. So I've been listening to all the pitches. Amazing, amazing ideas and businesses. Thank you. And uh, I, I want everyone to get to know you. So um, please, can you, I, I know that we have many things in common, first of this. I mean, I've been, uh, you know, snooping around and checking out different interviews that you had. But uh, um, I, one of the things that we have in common is that when you were 22 years old, you arrived to a new country and you were also staying in a couch. Uh, <laughs> yes. It sounds familiar for many of us here. Uh, so how did your journey lead you to where you are today? Oh, wow. Um, well, I think that that initial kind of bold move. Um, so I grew up in the United States. Um, I grew up in Florida and Oklahoma principally. And so Oklahoma is in, if you guys don't know your geography, most Americans don't. Um, <laughs> Oklahoma is in is in the middle, like Southwest, um, and it's a relatively conservative place. It's a small state, and um, not a lot of people leave Oklahoma, right? Like not a, a lot of people leave Oklahoma and and move to Spain. And because I had studied languages all my life, and my first job experience was pretty horrific. And at 22 years old, I would thought, well, if this is what is waiting for me in the corporate world, I'm going to have to really change my life plan. So my father at the time said, well, look, you know, no one says that you have to, you know, climb the corporate ladder at the age of 22. And you've always been, you know, really into learning languages. So why don't you go someplace and really be bilingual? And so I did. I had a couch for two weeks. So I packed my dad, funded my trip by only buying me a one way, one way ticket so I couldn't chicken out. And um, and then I ha would have to pay my way back. <laughs> Right. Like I would have to get a job and figure out how to get back home. So um, and and it was like the scariest and boldest thing I've ever done in my life. But it absolutely changed my life. Um, and it changed my life in so many ways, Micah. And you and I have talked about this, like the first four or five months were, were just terrible. I think I had blisters on my blisters on my blisters from walking around and trying to find a job and trying to figure out a new city. And I thought I spoke Spanish really well, but it turns out I really didn't. And it just was an exercise, Micah, in how resilient and resourceful you can be when you have the need to be <laughs> resilient and resourceful. And I, there's so many funny stories from that first year in Spain. But I think um, aside from the funny stories, what it taught what it taught me at the you know ripe old age of 22 or 23 is that living outside your comfort zone is when you really learn, when your growth happens, when when you are like really living outside your comfort zone is when your growth, personal growth, personal and professional growth happens. And you know, 20 years later. Actually, it's more than 20 years. It's 30 years later. So I arrived in Spain in like 92. Um, and this time around, um, I've been here for 20 years. And for me, Spain is home. And I think one of the things that I should say that I discovered about being a foreigner in another country, in another culture, is that sometimes... Um, you want to just blend in and sometimes you, you know, like everybody wants to belong. And I think one of the things that I kind of did right was I belonged up into a point, but I embraced my uniqueness and I used my uniqueness as my professional strength. So there weren't, when I arrived here, there weren't a lot of women like me in, in the tech industry when I joined Microsoft here in 2004. And so um, you know, being bilingual and being able to straddle two cultures for me has always been such a huge professional strength for me, being able to kind of be that um, translator, not just language translator, but culture translator and to be able to you know, translate, you know, Amer an American multinational into Spain and vice versa to advocate for my my adopted country back with with that home, you know, with that that big American conglomerate multinational. 
And it, it helped build actually a lot of entrepreneurial skills because you had to do a lot of things, you know, especially working these multinationals is learn how to do things with not a lot of resources, learn how to build an ecosystem of partners and support, right? Like that, you know, you can't do it all on your own, nor can you do it even if you're working for a subsidiary of a multinational company. So all of those things, I think, have have kind of shaped the way that I approach my professional and my personal life. But I would say, you know, just to kind of sum it all up, Micah, I think if you ever have the chance to even work a few months outside your home country, just even a few months, even, you know, a quarter, three months where you're fully embedded and living in another culture, you would be amazed at how much education you get out of that time and how much personal and, and professional growth you would get out of it. And so I always tell women all the time, if you're given the opportunity with your company or with your job to work in another country, that it will, it, it, it not only looks good on your resume and your LinkedIn profile, but it just makes you a stronger professional and a stronger person and more empathetic and more empathetic. <laughs> I, I totally agree. And, uh, you will develop skills that you never thought that you will be able to develop as well. Exactly. I, yeah, you're preaching to the choir here, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. You have demonstrated like, a constant commitment to sustainability, gender equality, <laughs> and creating environments where talent can grow. As you mentioned earlier, um, to grow, you need to get out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask you, how do you create a company culture that allows talent to grow, but it also recognizes diversity, inclusion, and intersectionality? Wow, that's a lot, Micah. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> Look where um, we live here. <laughs> right, that's a, that's a lot. Um, so I want to say that the first way as a leader that I inc I encourage diversity and inclusion and intersectionality is I um and it, it I, it's funny because this is our new tagline for singular the unconventional delivered but I am a, a fairly unconventional leader I do crazy things that some people don't understand like I move people from departments where they never dream that they would want to work but I'm like okay I see all these skills in you and I think if you put these all together you can go there I I I promote people I. I promote people who never thought they wanted to be a leader, but I see the leader who they are. And sometimes I promoted people outside of a seniority hierarchy, like had them jump, you know, the person that would have been the logical, like I just do things that sometimes tick people off, but, but later they, they kind of understand it. And so I think one of my special talents Right. Like I don't I don't toot my horn about many things, but I tend to be a good reader of people and I tend to be a good cheerleader of people. And so when I recognize potential in somebody and that person either has a confidence gap to get to where they need to be or didn't see all of the potential they had in that particular area, I'm really good at refocusing that person. And that actually really promotes diversity and inclusion, because usually it is outside the status quo. And, you know, one of my favorite phrases, and I robbed this from a woman called Cindy Gallup, um, and you can follow her on Twitter or you can follow her anywhere. Actually, she's, I think she's on all the social media platforms and she's absolutely a rebel, but she says that women challenge the status quo because they never are it. And so a lot of times, what I do is challenge the status quo and I do it with promotions and I do it, um, I do it in the middle of meetings and there are little things that I encourage the people who report to me and the people in my company to do that, that, in, that have that inclusivity because, inclu you know, diversity is not just gender diversity. There are lots of ways to look at, at, at diversity. You can, you know, it can be cultural diversity. It can be um, sexual orientation. It can be your character. You know, I talk a lot about, um, at LinkedIn, where there was a definite bias to hire people that were extroverts, just huge all over the place, extroverts, like everyone bouncing off the walls with lots of energy, right? And so, you know, if you have all of these like clones, it's like the clone army, you know, in the end, and it's not effective, it leads to group think, you know, no one, you know, you want, in the end, as a leader, what you want is diversity of thought, 
and diversity of ideas. And that comes in so many shapes and forms and people with disabilities and people from, you know, with different languages. And I think having left my home country where, and, and a state that's, that's quite white, <laughs> Um, and coming, you know, to, you know, working in companies that were multinationals, it's, it's really easy once you see how beautiful it is to have a company where you have so many diverse points of view and so many diverse histories coming in to feed products and ideas and services. It just leads to people being more engaged, people thriving. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then also you have to do very deliberate things, Micah. So I, I'm, I realize I'm being long-winded, but it's obviously something I'm passionate about. Oh, I, it doesn't I just know. happen with one person, Micah. <laughs> It just doesn't happen with one person. I know, but uh, we need more leaders and especially more women, just like you, leading a tech company that has all of this into perspective and check. And right. I know that in the tech world, it's extremely difficult. So that's why we are opening the conversation here today. And also we are moving to another topic that uh, is uh, being also part of this diversity mm -hmm. and inclusivity. And I know that you are extremely passionate about it. That is AI. Mm. And, uh, you know, looking at the latest stats and the presence of women in AI, apparently only 22% of AI professionals globally are women. So I have here two things, you know, that mm. I wanted to ask you. The first one is, how can we increase our presence and make the different stakeholders of the entrepreneurial ecosystem invest in more women training and programs for us mm. so we can make a bigger presence there? And the other one is, what kind of opportunities do you see in an eye for women and all female teams in the different startups? Okay, so let's address the first one. Um, and, and the lack of presence of, of women in AI. So this like slapped me in the face. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a book called Weapons of Maths Destruction. Um, and it, it talks about how, um, you know, artificial intelligence is based on learning, machine learning, like a, a, a algorithms based on algorithms that learn from data, right? Like they, mm -hmm. they large data models. And so the problem is, is a lot of those large data models, the programming is being done by men and all the data that's underlying those programming models is also biased. <laughs> and so you it's a double whammy, right? So you have biased data and you have, and then you have people who obviously, and they're not meaning to be biased, okay? So I just don't, I don't wanna cast aspersions on men. Everybody comes with their unconscious biases and you know, it, it's not being done on purpose. It's just most people, you know, run home to mama when they're doing things and running home to mama means I go back to what I know. So, yes, it is distressing. It is not just an AI, Micah. And we are going backwards with women in STEM, in STEM careers. We're going backwards. Like in the last three or four years, the pandemic has done us absolutely no favors. And so it is absolutely highly important that we as women are encouraging younger women to at least dabble in technology, at least understand basic coding. And here's the brilliant thing, Micah. I actually think generative AI and all of these other models sitting on top of generative AI will actually help us because it actually makes you skip a couple of steps. It actually kind of simplifies the coding process, like a lot of basic coding now, like what they just announced on November 3rd, um, OpenAI with the new um, GPTs, which basically do the coding for you, but you can see the underlying code. Like I, I think, you know, addressing the problem with women in, in STEM careers, not just in, a, in AI, is absolutely urgent. And I think everyone is conscious of it. But I think we've almost missed a generation in the last 10 years of, of getting more women into these careers. But I also want to tell people that actually AI isn't that scary, right? Like it's scary as a career. Scary is a career because it's based on logic. It is based on, and these LLMs are actually based on how we think and speak as humans. And so I actually see a lot of opportunity for women in quality engineering, in checking the models, right? Like why aren't there more women founding companies out there that are actually doing the quality control? There should be not just women. I mean, it should be, you know, underrepresented populations. It should be women doing the quality control. I see it in singular. Like our quality engineering department 
Like there are lots of women that are in those roles that are excellent at it. I was just at a conference two weeks ago where um, there was a woman called Sandra Hernandez who was doing quality engineering for NASA, right? And even if these AI models are doing coding and writing the algorithms, there always needs to be a human checking it. No company worth its weight in gold is going to publish code written by a machine and not have it some sort some sort of quality check. So I think that that's a real model. But the other thing that I see in my consulting role, Micah, is mm -hmm. everybody's jumping on this generative AI bandwagon yeah. because everybody's talking about how much impact it's going to have in the economy. But here's the thing. When we talk to clients, they're, they're basically tell us, tell us what we can do with it. I mean, that is basically the conversation. Tell us what we can do with this. I see a huge opportunity for women, consultants, whatever, to go in and help do that brainstorming, understand the potential of the model. You don't need to be a coder for this, Mike. You don't need to be a coder for this. You need to understand the basic logic behind generative AI and what the potential is. Do the work, do the training, but then accompanying these clients on how to take advantage of those models. And then also having that whole filter of social responsibility using the technology in a socially responsible way. And I really see women stepping into that void and really filling a role there. And then there's like, just on a very practical level, this thing that they've just created with these GPTs where you can do these little models. Like I see lots, like I was like, okay, if I were a woman start doing a startup right now, I would just get really good at programming these GPTs for clients, especially for small and medium businesses who don't, who aren't able to, to like have a big tech consultant behind them, there is a huge, huge potential in that area right now. Uh, yes, even for institutions, and as you said, a, a small yeah. businesses and, and governments, because uh, they're catching in a different pace. We know that for sure. Um, you mentioned bringing also the social impact into STEM and also uh, AI. Um, I know that... Um, you're always looking uh, uh, to start innovative, um, innovative um, technology-based projects that can make a difference. So um, how do you measure impact? Well, I mean, there's a lot of ways to measure impact, Micah. I mean, there's, you know, lives change. There's, you know, is your technology, um, you know, having an impact on the climate? Like, um, you know, even little simple projects about publishing you know, white papers on how to have developers write more efficient code so that we're consuming less energy. I mean, there's there's a lot of ways to measure impact, but, you know, one of the ones that I really like is, you know, do my employees feel better and feel more engaged and feel like they're, that we're really living up to our purpose if we put this product or this service out into the world, right? Like, I think most employees and most of us today are looking for for that special purpose. I think the other thing is, you know, how we, you know, if we're, you know, how disruptive are we? Are we disrupting something? Are we disrupting a business model that, you know, was potentially a toxic business model before? And how are we improving that toxic business model um, for, for the rest of the population? Um, you know, which, you know, there's lots of social impact investing funds, right, Micah, that are trying <laughs> That are, oh, that are, would be another another conversation. Another and a whole other conversation. Um, for me, you know, the most important things are lives changed. You know, whether or not, you know, I would be proud. You know, there's like this, you know, pride of of belonging, of whether or not there's pride and belonging for 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 our employees. But I think the other thing is when you come. From it from a tech perspective most people in the in the tech world are looking at, at whether this really is changing the world like you know the change factor it like i said the disruption factor and the economic impact you're having on a population the economic you're like whether it's a um a, a minority population or a disfavored population or whether it's a you know population of disability where you're bringing like one of the things that i loved at microsoft was how we were trying to change all of these these tools so that it could be used by people who are blind or hearing impaired or mobility impaired like you know how those things change the way that you view the place that you work 
Like, I just think every company needs to have some sort of social impact project, project to, to compensate for the fact that, you know, in the end, businesses are money-making ventures. And if leadership or your employees aren't giving back in some way, then what's the point? Like, I think we all want to work, you know, even though I think stakeholder capitalism has been maligned a lot, you know, in the last five years and DEI initiatives are being um, defunded and there's been kind of a backlash on ESG. I still firmly believe that companies that are getting B Corp certifications that are really looking at ISO certifications in the areas of ESG are going to actually be the ones that have long-term wealth and health as for organizations. Sure. For sure. And, uh, you know, the agenda 2030 is there and yeah. uh, not, too, not too many companies and governments are complying with it. So no. it's going to be quite interesting what happens in the in the next years and actually how we can uh, make this work and that becomes in, in, in a form that becomes uh, beneficial for our community. And one of the reasons why I wanted our community to meet uh, Sara is because, as I mentioned before during the summit, we are in a transition year with Heroica and Sara is uh, one of the women that uh, are inspiring us to figure out how we can create the new platform. And we are in conversations and talking how we will be able to create the new features for the Heroicas to benefit everyone in the community. So we will keep you, and this is something that we wanted to share with the community during the, the next year, we will figure out a way of uh, building something that could be manageable for the community or finding the way that's where we are at the stage that we are. And that's why I wanted to introduce all of you to her because I really appreciate our community, all the community partners such as um, Singular that are stepping in and seeing the impact that we are generating. And we feel extremely humble and thankful for uh, making us continue to dream that we can do better in our communities. And for that, just to start in that conversation, I thank you and I want to invite you again next year to be with me and present. On it. <laughs> we are going on this crazy trip in the couch together <laughs> to bring uh, tools and opportunities for the community. Um, before we go, um, I want to ask you for, because we're running out of time, but I wanna ask you for, um, what tips are you going to give to the community in these uncertain times to help them keep their business sustainable as a CEO that you are? Well, I, I, I think being a CEO is all about focus, Micah, and especially in, in hard times. And I'm doing the same thing, right? Like I have an, a company with 1400 employees right now. We're going through the budgeting process. Nothing that is, we are focusing on doing less things better. We are focusing investment on growth, like, and, but, but really reducing the number of distractions. I think it's so important in crisis times to focus, reduce the number of distractions, invest only where you feel like you are hitting your niche and you are not going into a market where, you know, you're going to be, you know, pushing your elbows out to get, you know, get through the competition, focus on what you do best double down on what you do best, double down on what you do best. And the other thing that we're focusing on is how can you disrupt yourself? Think of your business model and think of your the, the, the economic or the ecosystem that you're in. What can you do differently that is going to make a difference for your clients? What can you do differently that the competition can't do, that you uniquely can do that is going to make a difference? So those things, focus on your core, invest in your strengths. Don't look at what's going on over here. Invest in your strengths, invest in your clients and get rid of all the distractions right now, all of them. And also one more thing, this is super important. I can't believe I didn't mention this. Make sure you're taking care of your people. Yeah. Make sure you're taking care of your people because they know things are, not particularly, you know, 
celebratory right now. Make sure you're focusing on your people because you're going to need them. You're going to need them to go through this crisis with you. Make sure that they're just as focused as you are on what's important. I totally agree. I always uh, tell my daughter every morning, come here and give me those magic kisses that I need them for the day. And that's better than a spinach sometimes. <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> Mine's hugs. Hugs. <laughs> <laughs> Sara, now everyone in the community is super excited. So we'll keep them posted. And really, uh, from the bottom of my heart, uh, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today and also um, helping us to look for solutions as well. So we'll be in touch soon. And thank you so much. Really. Thank you, Micah. Thank you for inviting me. And, and hello to everybody all around the world. <laughs> That was great. Um, so you see, uh, you can always uh, look at the community and try to find ways to, to help out. Uh, so um, next, I have a, a really soft spot for the Academy of Women Entrepreneurs, as uh, many of you know. And I want to say hi to everyone, to all the hours from Cuba. A big hug. Um, we are also facilitators um, through our Asociación Heroica and also a big shout out to the president of the Asociación Heroica, Pino Kiri. She was our MC the first day of the summit. And uh, I want to introduce you to um, our next uh, participants from East Asia and Pacific with their amazing projects. So uh, I want to introduce you to Miss Seni. Araez, owner at Whistler Travel and Tours. Irene Cho, co-founder at uh, Comun Hibu. Anila Esvastava, executive uh, director at ID Stats Research and Consultancy. And Gabriela Wan, director and owner at Innovative Gears. Four years ago, I envisioned a travel agency that would be more than just a business. It would be a testament to my passion for unveiling the world's wonders to travelers. Today, that dream stands before you as Whistler Travel and Tours, a tangible reality born out of love and a relentless pursuit of excellence. Whistler Travel and Tours was established in July 2019, not driven by profit, but by a dream fueled by love. My vision went beyond the ordinary. I wanted to create experiences that transcended boundaries, itched memories in the soul, and left travelers breathless with wonder. Whistler Travel and Tours became a manifestation of my love for exploring the unexplored, and my zeal for sharing the world's beauty. In the ever-evolving travel industry, passion alone is not enough. To make a mark, one must adapt and innovate continually. Recognizing this, Whistler Travel and Tours embarked on a digital transformation journey. Technology became the cornerstone of our service enhancing efficiency, and crafting a travel experience that resonates with the modern traveler. However, technology is not enough to forge meaningful connections. Whistler Travel and Tours understood the importance of a real-time customer service. Every click on our website is an opportunity to create a connection. By improving website engagement, through real-time customer service, we aim to ensure every visitor feels valued and provide an online experience as delightful as the journeys we offer. Our vision extends beyond catering to corporate foreign accounts. We aspire to reach a broader audience. Whistler Travel and Tours aim to become a household name symbolizing exceptional travel experiences accessible to everyone, 
regardless of their background or purpose of travel. We want to be the bridge that connects dreams with destinations, aspirations with adventures. The story of Whistler Travel and Tours is not just a business narrative. It's a tale of passion, dedication, and a relentless pursuit of excellence. It reminds us that significant endeavors begin with love. Love for what we do, the people we serve, and the world we explore. As we stand on the threshold of tomorrow, let's carry this reminder forward. Our journey is itched with the indelible ink of love, and guided by innovation, commitment, and inclusivity. I am Senith Arise, the proud owner of Whistler Travel and Tours. Thank you for being part of this incredible journey. Here's to many more adventures, cherished memories, and a world embraced by the boundless love that fuels Whistler Travel and Tours. Together, let's continue to explore, experience, and embrace the world. May we all be Whistlers of Love. Thank you and mabuhay. Hi everyone, I am Irene, I am from Brunei, and I'm one of the co-founder of Community Hub. Um, Community Hub was formed in 2018 um, as a solution to address a gap in uh, experiential community-based experience, uh, community-based tourism. Uh, our mission here at Community Hub is to connect travelers with local communities in Brunei to preserve, to sustain um, its culture, arts, and craft. We offer customized hands-on experiences aiming to transform um, tourism into a sustainable income for locals and provide travelers with authentic cultural um, encounters. Uh, what we need to continue to continue operating uh, and expanding our impact we need support in terms of partnerships, uh, both with local communities and other businesses in tourism sector. Um, additionally, funding and resources for marketing and technology development are crucial to reach broader um, audience and provide a, a seamless platform uh, for our users. Um, overall, collaboration and investment are key for us to thrive and continue um, our mission of sustainable tourism through community-based experiences. Um, I'm very grateful to be here today and I look forward to meeting everybody. Thank you, bye. There's no business on a dead planet. I recently saw this headline in a Forbes article and frankly, I cannot agree with it more. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Anila Srivastava. I'm a researcher and educator by profession, and my expertise lies in the intersection of human-centered insights, behavior change, and sustainability consulting. Today, I'm here to introduce to you Action Impact, a Singapore-based company on the mission to ignite net positive change in the world. Our focus revolves around three key pillars. Firstly, in creating economic value by helping corporate and social sector organizations put people and the planet at the heart of their business. Secondly, helping organizations integrate sustainability into their financial strategy, thereby enabling the management to make informed decisions that drive everlasting impact. Thirdly, helping organizations magnify the impact of their philanthropy and CSR initiatives by helping in partner selection and by leveraging established frameworks and processes to map outputs and outcomes of the funds invested. So why did we start on this journey? We embarked on this journey because we are committed to preserving our beautiful planet for future generations. And we believe that unless we shift from an exploitative mindset to a regenerative one, sustainability, where sustainability isn't just a buzzword, 
but a way of life, it will soon be too late. To help us grow, we need to forge new collaborations and strategic partnerships that help us scale the impact of the Action Impact Initiative. So if any of you is looking to embark on any sustainability or impact assessment project in Singapore, South Asia or Southeast Asia, please do not hesitate to reach out to us at anila at actionimpact.sg. Together, let's write a brighter and sustainable future for us all. There's no business on a dead planet, but there is an endless potential for growth, prosperity, and positive change when we choose to act together. Thank you for your time and consideration. Good day, my name is Gabriella Wong, and I am the owner and director for Innovative Gears, a logistics company based in Suva, Fiji, in the Pacific. I began this company in 2017, driving my two-ton truck. What inspired me to start was seeing all the courageous women out in New Zealand driving semi-trailers. Now, they're huge trucks, and in Fiji, that was not normal. So, I decided to bring that back home, create my hashtag Chinese Lady Truck Driver, and after one year of driving by myself, I found that there were gaps in the market that we could tap into. My husband joined me, there were two drivers, and we now have between five to ten boys as porters. We haul or move domestic items, commercial, hardware, anything that can fit our truck, and we will either provide the full service, so shrink wrapping, packaging, uh, registering it for export. I mean, uh, during COVID, my first export went all the way to Samoa. We now have storage in our 40 foot containers and uh, we've attached a trailer so now we can haul up to four tons. Recently uh, we decided to offer um, construction services and property management. Now these, so the company has grown from property movement to property maintenance and our third arm is property management. Now along, along this journey of uh, maintaining property uh, we saw uh, a gap in the market where green waste was being transported to the landfill and my husband has a background in um, biofuels and chemicals. He, one day he just sat back and said, why aren't we doing anything with the green waste? So we decided to look into that. Now it is possible we can convert and what we'd like to call our next phase is called the gas to gra uh, grass to gas initiative where we take all the, the the green waste that we've collected feed it into a bio um, biodigester and that creates our product biomethane ideally we would have li liked to start a few years ago but uh, i've recently had two cho two children so that's added a lot on our plate. We've done the groundworks for our next project. Um, we've, we've, we've purchased three acres of land, so we will use this, this area to dump all the green waste and then slowly convert it into gas. Um, I don't have enough time to explain the whole system, but um, it is possible as other countries are doing it. In 2019, we hauled up to 90 tons of green waste from domestic houses alone, and we dumped this all at the landfill. So we thought, what if we could get both domestic and commercial um, entities on board, and instead of dumping it at the landfill, we would feed a biodigester and create and cut our costs, and uh, this biomethane would be used to fuel our trucks. So we've approached different councils, we've looked at the different stakeholders out there and it seems possible for us to try our, our green initiative. The ideas came around when I joined Awe and Triple GI, these different programs that inspired me to unlock different light bulbs and see how my business could give back to the community. So that is our next project. Um, I do hope I have somewhat inspired some of you out there and I hope you would look to entrepreneurship for your journey. Thank you.
as I was mentioning earlier, uh, we have, we're so lucky to have these amazing women and these amazing uh, projects from all over the world. So thank you so much to Zenith, Irene, Anila, and Gabriela. And, and now we have another um, um, set of, uh, uh, of uh, all programs, I mean, yes, all projects that are coming from the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs in Near East and South Asia. And the following projects are possible by Aisha Waira Jawar, founder at uh, Ekatra, Arwa Osama, founder and managing director at um, AL for Sajia, and Ms. Janat Jair Giotti, founder at Shata Bunon. Hi everyone, it has been an absolute pleasure to listen to so many inspiring and motivating stories. I think this is what keeps us all moving. Um, I'm Ashwara, I'm founder of Ekatra. Ekatra is a sustainable stationery and a lifestyle collective. We work with homemakers in Rajasthan, India who can't essentially work outside their houses. When I say we work with homemakers, I don't necessarily mean uh, people from craft communities but just homemakers. We scout them through word of mouth and these are people with immense skill and talent. We identify them and we give them work, we bring work to them in their households. This story interestingly started uh, by my educational background. I'm an urban planner and because of my thesis, I had to travel to a lot of parts in India. That is when I understood that a lot of these homemakers, they had a lot of uh, skill uh, in stitching and sewing because they would make uh, uh, clothes and toys for everybody in their house. So that is when I identified that nobody is monetizing or uh, giving them employment opportunities. That is how Ekatra came in and then I connected those dots back to my hometown also where even my grandmother and mother had those issues where again immense talent and skill but no platform to showcase any of it. That is how Ekatra was born. Because I come from the thought of a sustainable school, sustainability was something that was key to establishing Ekatra. That is when we decided that we are going to put three pillars here. One is women empowerment at the core of everything that we do. Second, to develop sustainable alternatives of lifestyle products. So we make um, anything and everything under the range of stationery, gifting and lifestyle products uh, that could replace plastic like even your pouches, gift cards, uh, laptop sleeves, journals, anything and everything. When I talk about sustainability, it is not just a term that we use for the fad of it. We, we have a second life project that works under Ekatra where, uh, where um, whatever residues are left in ours or our collaborators workshop, we upcycle them into creating new products. Just for the, uh, just for an example, even our visiting cards, so whatever residues of cloth and paper were left, instead of throwing those away, we've created our cards out of that. Just one small example of it. And the third pillar was to um, make very intentional and conscious uh, designs and choices while even sourcing our material. So those are the three key pillars on which we established Ekatra. I hope to connect with you all very soon. Thank you so much. Hello, hope you are doing well. This is Arwa reaching out from Egypt. I'm the founder and managing director of the Fursagaya platform, which stands for Opportunity Hunters in Arabic. And Fursagaya serves as a Korean consulting platform dedicated to the youth of Upper Egypt. Our primary goal is to increase uh, the awareness about tech jobs in the governorates of Upper Egypt and enhance the personal and professional skills of young individuals Actually, we aim to connect them with suitable jobs and internships. The motivation behind uh, starting the Fursagaya stems from personal experience as a female hiring from Upper Egypt. I noticed the lack of opportunities available in the region. Many girls face challenges in continuing their education or traveling alone due to common culture and traditions. Actually, I remember uh, when 
uh, I told my dad I will travel to the Cairo to continue the, to, co to continue my education, and he told me, Arwa, what are you saying? <laughs> um, moreover, the mindset there prefer to investment in agriculture rather than education or career, de career development. In the light of all these challenges, I made the decision to obtain my master degree in the capital and establishment for Sagaya at the project between Upper Egypt and companies located in North Egypt. Since starting the for Sagaya, uh, we have uh, successfully reached out to 3,000 followers on our social media platforms and we have provided internships and jobs to 300 young individuals and we trained more than 3,000 participants and we organized more than 8 career awareness events across 8 governorates in Upper Egypt. These efforts have aimed to inspire youth and encourage them to develop their skills and experience. As any startup, we have faced many challenges <laughs> during this period of global economic crisis uh, and to ensure the smooth operation of our process uh, we are seeking potential networking opportunities and collaborations uh, with entities or donors who share our vision of promoting career development and get access to funding is crucial for our growth and sustainability finally the guidance and support of mentors will greatly assist us um, in analyzing and completing our future steps. Thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, uh, we can get networking with each other through LinkedIn and I hope all the best and success for all of women across all over the world as well. Thank you so much. Bye. Hello everyone, this is Janna Johir Jyoti and I'm the founder of Shatobunan. It is a great honor to be speaking before you today at the prestigious Women Impact Summit 2023. I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to the organizers for extending the invitation to me and deep appreciation to the US Embassy Dhaka for connecting me to this remarkable event as a proud AWE graduate which is implemented by the Center for Entrepreneurship Development at Brack University. This program has equipped me with the knowledge and skills to scale my business and has nurtured my entrepreneurial spirit through extensive uh, trainings and insightful uh, sessions. Now, let's talk about Shatobunan. Shatobunan is an e-commerce platform uh, based in Rangpur, Bangladesh. Our core mission is to uplift women artisans and uh, preserve the cultural heritage of Shatorunji Raks. We do this by providing digital literacy training and a platform for these talented women artisans um, to showcase their work and connect directly with the buyers. Now, you might wonder, why did I start Shatobunun? Well, when I came to Rangpur for my university, I was introduced to the uh, rich tradition of Shatorunji Raks. I was amazed by the beauty and artistry of these creations, but soon, I discover a harsh real reality. About 300 women artisans uh, responsible for these uh, beautiful rugs were not being treated fairly. They didn't receive proper payment, uh, didn't even have recognition of their work, and many lived in poverty. This situation uh, deeply moved me, and I knew I had to take action. That's when I decided to create Shatobunon, a platform where, where the artisans could showcase their work and connect directly with the buyers. Through Shatobunon, we empower these women to become entrepreneurs by sharing their profiles and make uh, descriptions uh, of their previous work. Our milestone uh, is to improve their lives and uh, make a long-lasting impact. At Shatobunon, sustainability is the core of our business values. We are dedicated to integrating eco-friendly practices, empowering women artisans, and ensuring long-term economic viability. We minimize our environmental footprint through responsible sourcing, eco-friendly packaging, and energy-efficient operations. Since our inception, we have achieved significant milestones from onboarding artisans uh, and achieving 
successful sales to expanding our outreach through strategic partnerships and providing training programs. We have gained recognition and have successfully scaled our operations to create a lasting uh, positive impact. To continue our mission and make a larger impact, we need your support. As a new startup, we need enormous support uh, from this global community like we need help in seeking investment, increased uh, partnerships and avail mentorships, facilities which will help us to scale our business, reach more artisans and uh, create a wider impact to, uh, and of course ensure a global market. More specifically, uh, currently we are looking for funding opportunities and mentoring support for business uh, growth, website development and networking with like-minded uh, individuals and organizations. Additionally, we aim to utilize the AWE global platform to showcase uh, uh, the work of these talented women artisans to the global audience. Your support will help us to bridge these cultural divides, inspire conscious consumptions, and empower more women artisans to be successful entrepreneurs. In co uh, conclusion, Shotobunun is not just an e-commerce platform, it's a movement uh, to empower women artisans and preserve cultural heritage. We believe that by combining authenticity, empowerment, and sustainability, we can create a better future for the people and the planet. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration. I'm open up to any questions you may have, and I'm excited thinking about the potential opportunities to collab uh, collaborate with you all and uh, make Shatranji an amazing, successful story globally. Thank you, everyone. Oh, wow. Amazing projects. I always say it. We have the best projects from any other conference. Don't you agree with me? I think so, no? <laughs> uh, thanks again to Aishwarya, um, Arua, and, and Miss Janat. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. And I have a couple of announcements uh, before um, we... Uh, say goodbye to our fourth summit. We are sad, but at the same time, we're really happy because we have seen the impact that we've been creating in the past days and even the weeks before the summit. Um, we want, on behalf of all our team, thank you for being by our side and actually inspiring us. So the first thing that I have to tell you, and this is a message from Irina. <laughs> Hi, Irina, from our marketing and communications team. Uh, she mentioned it to me that, uh, don't worry, we're going to send you an email with uh, all the different resources and links that have been mentioned during the summit. And we will also post it in the website. So don't worry, just uh, give us a couple of days or maybe a week. <laughs> so we will post everything and we will share it with all of you. The second thing that I want to announce uh, is that uh, since you've been here with all of us till the end of the summit, um, and I know that many of you has asked us for um, a ticket for the networking party, our team is going to put in the chat now uh, the link for the networking party and actually the passcode and everything so you can join us, okay? This is a special gift for all of you because we really want to see you later at uh, noon. Actually, in 30 minutes, we're starting uh, the networking party and we would love to see you there and actually talk one-on-one -on -one and and get the opportunity to, to meet each other, you know? So I would love to, to do that. Um, the other thing that I wanna share with all of you is that uh, please send us uh, an email to info at heroica.com. So we can send you information about uh, our events, upcoming events, um, also about the different initiatives we're going to be working on and the different programs that uh, we're going to be participating in with uh, different partners. Um, also check out our newsletter and try to 
to get into our newsletter. But if you send us an email, it would be great. Um, since this year, you know, we are working on the new platform. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the summit, we have plans for you. So you're gonna help us on the discovery process and we will be in contact with all of you to build the right platform that we need. So we can connect, we can actually get access to the right resources and the right ecosystem to make our projects and our initiatives more sustainable, okay? Remember, if Heroica is your village, uh, the Woman Impact Summit is our celebration of all the work that we do during the year. And I can't wait to see you next year, that it would be our fifth year and we are planning to have a big party for sure. Um, I just wanna take uh, the opportunity to say thank you so much to all our sponsors, the US Embassy in Spain and Andorra, Cheryl Porro Coaching, Casa Africa, Asociación Heroica, all our Heroica uh, team, um, also, to say thank you to Super Pino, the president of the Heroica Association. Please reveal yourselves to the, our production team. Where is Irene and Sylvia? I don't know if you can see them. Thank you so much. Um, also to Irina from Communications and Marketing. She's our head of Communications and Marketing at Heroica. And um, also to all our interpreters. Carla, Anouk, you've been always collaborating with us. We have you in our heart. And of course, to Pearl and Andrea that are coming also into the picture this year. Thank you, thank you so much. And we hope to see you soon and next year, okay? And come to the networking party. It's gonna be great. <laughs>